Christian, we have Brother Adam Russell and his son Christian with him this, this morning. Uh, their calling is to be missionaries in Mexico. So he's going to present his burden for us at the 4 o'clock. So. so Acts chapter 10 and then 2 Timothy chapter 2. On the book of Acts, you have an interesting thing. In Acts chapter 8, there's a black man that gets saved. In Acts 9, you have a brown man or a Jewish man that gets saved. In Acts 10, you got an Italian or a white man getting saved. That's the three basic races. Uh, but, of course, we live in a day and age, you can't talk about those things because people are so hypersensitive. But uh, it's a person being accepted by God in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Of course, I'm just going to read a portion of the story. You can read the whole thing. A fellow named Cornelius. Uh, and Peter is the guy that's witnessing to him. Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Referring to any race. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Okay, now he's still trying to figure out the Old Testament doctrine coming into the New Testament. So that's why you'll see him say that. But I like that word, that phrase, is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall, have, shall receive remissions of sins. Now, Peter wasn't done talking here, but the Spirit of God interrupted him. And then in verse 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, the Holy Ghost came upon Cornelius because at that moment he believed in Jesus Christ. And it says, when Peter yet spake these words, so he, was, he didn't say, in closing, I'd like to give you this poem. Uh, he didn't say that. He was, still had, he was probably going to say Acts 2.38, but the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Okay, all of them that which heard the word, that'd be Cornelius and everybody that he got in the house. And then they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now that was all done by faith. No H2O involved there, and there's a reason why. Okay, now if you would, let's try 2 Timothy Chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, okay, Timothy was um, a young fellow that Paul had led to Christ, and he uh, was used by the Lord to become a, a pastor of some way, and in 2 Timothy 2, uh, verse 10, he said this, therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtained a salvation <clears throat> which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You have two things that are mentioned, salvation and eternal glory. So that would be glorification. 
It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That's a promise, okay? That's a doctrinal thing that when you trust Christ, you die, you are put in Christ, you're guaranteed to live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him, okay? That's the context, the reign, not the salvation, If we deny him, he also will deny us. Deny us what? Verse 12, the reign, not salvation. Verse 11, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. If a person suffers to the point of verse 12, where he actually personally loses his faith, God is faithful. That person has eternal security. That's a great promise there. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And then uh, verse changed in all the new Bibles, the first words removed, all the new Bibles take it out. And it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so we have two separate ideas going on here this morning. So if you would, let's pray. Lord, I pray you'd help us to see these two terms, accepted and approved. And I pray that you, your Spirit of God can uh, restore the souls of the ones who have, have felt rejected by either family, loved ones, friends, the world, or whatever. And then help us to see that you will accept each and every one who come through Jesus. I pray you'd help us to understand these ideas. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, uh, there's two words. In Acts 10 was a word accepted. And in 2 Timothy is a word approved. Not a three-point outline, but a two-pointer. So all homiletic teachers are happy. We have the same letter. Okay, so accepted and approved. Okay, accept and approved. Uh, the idea of being accepted, in Acts 10 was a fellow named Cornelius. He was a soldier, a centurion. He had 100 men he trained. He was a Gentile. He was an Italian. And he did the typical Italian thing. When the first pope showed up, he bowed and kissed his feet. And Pete said, get up. I'm just like you. Uh, the guy in, in Vatican don't do that anymore. Okay, but uh, Cornelius was accepted. He was accepted. Now, Peter was, his statement was still under the Old Testament ideas because he had a little different shift. He had a shift going through here through the book of Acts. But still, the idea of being accepted, I don't know about you, but I think that's a glorious idea, to be accepted by somebody. Okay, and then the other one is a person who was approved by God, because he understood a proper, systematic study of the Bible, okay, to be approved. To be accepted by somebody is one thing, to be approved is another thing. Okay, now this idea of being accepted, uh, the acceptance is re, it's like receiving somebody into a club. Okay, everybody, you know why peer pressure is so powerful is because... We all want to feel accepted by somebody. Okay, and so when, like in inner cities, when a child has been born into a family and they possibly don't know where their dad is, and they feel rejected, and so they live a life of feeling rejected, and that's why the gangs are so powerful, because when a kid joins a gang, he feels accepted. When we worked up in a big church in Hammond, there's a girl that Jan had worked with, and her gang, I don't know if it was a Seventh-day Adventist gang, but what kind of a gang, they couldn't have pork. So that one rule they had, can you imagine, a gang in the south side of Chicago, you couldn't eat pork to be in this gang. And so when they had pizza with the young people up there on a Sunday afternoon, she'd demand to see the box, she'd read the ingredients. If it had pork, she wasn't going to eat it. So I don't know if that was Seventh-day Adventist gang. I don't know if they don't like pork or a Jewish gang. It wasn't Jewish. They were pretty dark. And so, uh, but she felt accepted. And that's why she was in that gang. Uh, Everybody desires to be wanted, to be loved. Even God does. God set up the whole program with Lucifer, 
knowing that the majority of people are going to re reject him, but yet he did that because he wants to voluntarily be loved and accepted. That's why he set up the program he's got. In his infinite wisdom, he did not want robots. He wanted voluntary love, and that's why he did what he did. Now, we each have that. This is why people join a club or a lodge. Okay, this is why they do that. They, because they feel accepted. A gang or a team. In sports, you have the camaraderie of a team. In the military, you've got the camaraderie of the soldiers in your, in your troop or whatever. Okay, uh, now God's program, ideal program, is you feel accepted in your family. That's his ideal program. Now, my wife and I have been tremendously blessed that we felt accepted within our family, our parents. But when the family has gone disarray where they can't even figure out, is it got to be a male and a female to be a dad and a mom? Oh, I got two mommies. I mean, they're so confused nowadays. And this is why people are going everywhere is because they don't feel accepted. They're going to try this route. They're going to try that route. They're going to try this route. Uh, in the colleges, you'll have fraternities. Okay, and what is it? It's everybody's joining a group because they want to feel accepted. Now, when a person gets acceptance from God, God can give that individual confidence, and we don't need a group. When I went through high school, you know, I, you know, I was a loner. You know, and, you know, didn't, the kids thought it was funny that I didn't come into town during the summertime. You know, we lived just six miles you know, east of here, and come August when we'd show up, or September, we always started a couple of years, a couple of weeks after the KV, which I thought was great. But that means we got a couple of weeks late in, September, in the summer. But uh, they'd usually get on a bus and say, hey, did you come into town this summer? And I said, no, nah, I don't think I did. And they thought that was the funniest thing. I just stayed home, stayed on a farm, uh, played baseball with the, the barn by myself. It was the Cubs and the Cardinals. Cubs, Cardinals always won because I like the Cardinals. And, uh, I mean, that was just me. You know, I'd go down swimming in a little ditch, you know, and that was just my life. And, but I felt accepted by my parents. So when I went through school, I, I didn't have to have, you know, best friends. I, I'm not a, against that. I didn't feel that need because I felt accepted in my family. But not, not too many people have that blessing. They really don't. And that is truly a blessing. Uh, this is why fads and fashions are so effective. Is because people want to dress a certain way because they feel, effect, they feel uh, uh, accepted when they dress in a certain fashion. Can you imagine that? Go to Walmart and you see how some of them dress. Uh, politicians will actually compromise. They will compromise and actually, and some of them will sell their own mother out to be accepted by their party. And what is that? It's the need of a person who wants to feel accepted. Okay, and now to be accepted in a club is one thing. But what when that club gets together and they choose a spokesman for that club, that individual has stepped up to be the approved one. There's a step up here. So approval is like choosing a club member to represent the club. Now, this representative is like the advertiser or the ambassador of the club or the lodge, but if he falls out of approval, then they pull away his position. Now, he's still accepted in the club, possibly, but he's fallen out of approval. Now, in God's program... We get accepted by God through certain means throughout time. But that doesn't mean that everybody's accepted by God. He's going to put his hand on them and say, I want you, I approve of your behavior, your attitude, your actions. And so I'm putting my hand on you to fulfill a certain calling for me. And that's a person that's been approved. Now, the media is constantly hammering our culture, okay? They're constantly hammering our culture. And on the radio broadcast that I do at 9 o'clock, 
I usually hit a newsworthy event at the beginning of it, the first five minutes. Some people, that's, they turn it off after that because they get a kick out of that if they're on the conservative side. And I usually hit three topics. And this is, this is the American media constantly berating you and I. Abortion, Muslims, and sodomy. Those are the three that the American media is trying to cram down your throat and my throat. That's what they're trying to do. So I'll hit on those topics. Okay, during that time period. And what they're doing is these people within their spirit know in their conscience their behavior is wrong. But they want a facade that people accept them, and you can't force people to accept that. Okay, and that's the problem. That's why they're dealing with that. George Orwell wrote in his book, The Animal Farm, which I think a lot of us have read that. And if you remember reading The Animal Farm, they had pigs in there and all things. The pigs became the ones over the farm. And the pig said, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And that's the media is forcing what they say is more equal than a Bible believer. Okay, where when they say tolerant, what they expect is for you and I to admire them, adore them, and promote them. That's what they mean by tolerance. And if, you're in, and if you're not in their good graces, you will experience their intolerance. It only goes one way. It only goes one way. Okay, and that's the program. And so you just kind of yeah, go, go on with it and forget it. Try to forget it, but they're going to keep hammering you. They're going to keep hammering this culture. I tell you, when a church has to decide, when a church is having a confrontation of deciding, should we accept a gay pastor? I mean, they are so far gone, you might as well just take them out in the back and shoot them. Did I say that? No, I didn't mean that. Figuratively speaking. Okay, I mean, they're so far gone, it's pitiful. But if, it, if it's, you know, it's funny, one of the fellows at Rensselaer, he just told me something funny. He stopped at that Family Express down there by the Dutch church with the three sixes out front. And he was admiring the building and the lady behind the counter. He said, wow, what a beautiful church. And then he had set off the cuff. He said, what Bible do they preach from? And she said, well, I think the NIV. And then he says, that's too bad. And a blue, it just threw her for, what do you mean by that? Well, that's the devil's Bible. <laughs> she, he just walked out when her mouth was hanging open. That book takes Lucifer out and puts Jesus in. It's like saying that the devil is Jesus Christ. I mean, that, why don't you read it and find out for yourself? I mean, that was a shocking thing. You know, news to me. But I want to give you a couple thoughts, just a two-point outline. And, of course, to make our homiletics teacher, teacher happy, it's the alliterated, to be accepted. God, in this age, accepts any repentant sinner through Jesus Christ. That's a blessing. Any repentant sinner who humbles himself and comes to Christ. You know, as a referee in sports, I've ref basketball games a lot of times. A referee in sports judges the offenses of an athlete. So God judges the offenses of men. When I blow a whistle on a guy and he comes and says, well, God has got a love, shouldn't you forgive me? If I did that, there is another team that is going to scream and holler. Referees are not given the ability to forgive the offenses. They blow the whistle and point at the guy and say, foul, you traveled, double dribble. I didn't touch him. Yeah, but his arm just fell off. You may not have touched him, but somehow you have a miraculous thing that you can make his arm fall off without touching him. A referee does not forgive the offenses of a player. They blow the whistle, and God is the same. He blows the whistle on them. And that's kind of what street preaching is. You see, as a referee cannot forgive the offenses of the athlete, so God will not forgive the offense of a man Without the shedding of blood, he has that exception. And that blood shed is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would look in Jeremiah chapter 14. Foolish people believe God is to accept everyone. 
but he doesn't. Jeremiah chapter 14, it's Old Testament doctrine. This is when uh, Jerusalem was, uh, Israel was going down to tubes, or Judah. And, uh, you know, they thought, oh, God accepts me. You know, I'm gay and God loves me too. Uh, and God in heaven says, uh, I gave you the offer of love at Calvary. If you don't come to Calvary, then no, it ain't going to work. Jeremiah 14.10, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander, they have not refrained their feet, therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, me, Jeremiah, He said, Pray not for this people for their good. He said, don't waste time praying for them. He says, when they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by their pestilence. Now, that's when a nation went too far. That's when he pushed them too far. Now, that's Old Testament doctrine. I understand that. And, there, and that thing will bring into the New Testament. Okay, that idea still comes in the New Testament. But we don't know when God makes that choice. So from our perspective, if a person's still breathing, there's hope. Okay, but from God's perspective, that's between that person and God. The person says, I'm sincere and God will accept me. If you're sincere, you will admit your sin. If you're sincere. People a lot of times talk about Jehovah Witnesses go down knocking on doors. Oh, those people are sincere. I haven't met one yet that was sincere. Why? Because I talk to them. And when I point out a flaw in their Bible and they don't change, they prove to me they're not sincere. When I show them their book takes out 16 verses, you know, like that, what do you do with that? And I show them Revelation 1, verse 8, where it says, uh, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, saith Jehovah God. That's what their Bible says, so I use their Bible. And then I ask them, who's talking? They say, Jehovah God. Then I go to Revelation 22, 13, I'm Alpha and Omega, saith, uh, and then it says, uh, the beginning and the end. I said, who's talking? They say, Jehovah God. Then I read two verses later, look at it, I, Jesus. And now I smile and say, look at it, ain't that wonderful? Jesus is Jehovah God. And then watch the circuit breakers go off. And then they won't change. If they were sincere, they would say, I never saw that before. If they were sincere. But in their pride, they'll run to Greek, which they don't know, try to change the book. And they, well, the originals, well, you got them things? No. And I said, that's a problem I have with your faith. Everything you believe is based upon your personal opinion. And I say it to them as kind as I can, loving as I can, with a smile on my face. And that's, I, if they're sincere, they would change. If they're sincere. Well, I'm religious, God's going to accept me. No, religion is not the key. Righteousness is the key. There is a difference. Uh, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, <clears throat> the first two boys, Cain and Abel, if you look at those two guys, Cain was a religious one, and he was going to offer a sacrifice to God. <clears throat> and his brother Abel, his brother Abel went and got a lamb, was going to offer this lamb up for a sacrifice. And Cain tried to get blood out of a turnip, so he grabbed all his turnips and he grabbed all his uh, grape juice and all that stuff. And he offered that up to God. And Cain's on one side, you know, tic-tac-toe, three in a row, doing his, his thing. And Abel's on this side, throwing up the lamb and saying, Oh, God, if you would, please accept this as a substitute for me. And lightning came down and struck that one right over here. And Cain's over there, recognizing God's ignored him. Genesis 4, verse 7. God said to Cain, Why are you so mad? He said, If thou doest well, I will accept thee. And all Cain had to do is go ask his brother for a lamb. That's all he had to do. And get the fruit, knock all the fruit off his altar, take that lamb from his brother and put that on the altar and humbly some, cry out to that God and, God and lightning would have came down. But not in his case. Didn't happen. Why? Because he was proud. 
The glorious thing, if you would, in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4. <clears throat> Under the Old Testament, and this is where a person becomes approved of God when you can recognize the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are clear differences. Leviticus chapter 1, this is like the religious handbook for Judaism. Okay, Levi. It's the third book in the Old Testament, and he's giving the Jews, how can you be accepted by God under the Judaistic faith? Leviticus 1, verse 4, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. Okay, he has certain different choices of animals. And it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. So that's the substitute. So under the Old Testament, if a Jewish man recognized his sins, he could take it down to the Jewish temple and offer, if he had a lot of money, he used to offer a cow or cattle, a calf. If he was middle class, he used to offer a lamb. If he was poor, he can offer a turtle dove. If he was poorer than a church mouse, he'd go down to the local park, throw out some feed and grab a pigeon, and then offer the pigeon. All of those were accepted by God, and then he had an atonement with his God. Now, granted, it was temporary, but he still had an atonement with God. In the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1 lays it out for us. Ephesians chapter 1, for the New Testament opportunity that we have. It's the greatest news ever known to man. And it's a pardon that God is offering to everybody. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated. Okay, now I know down in Demot they have a hard time with that word. But having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to him according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now there's a good deal. The way a person becomes accepted in the beloved to be accepted in God's gang or God's family. It's through Jesus Christ. It's coming to Jesus Christ. And if nobody else accepts you, at least you got a God in heaven that did. I mean, that's a good deal. Nothing better than that. And you can rest in that fact. Now, granted, I know there still hurts when family or friends don't accept us, but you can rest in the fact that the God of the universe has accepted you. Through Jesus Christ. And when, when an individual accepts God's son, God births that person into his life and they become an acceptable saint. When we were in Colorado in the, the school that we worked with, there's a couple, three, I think three kids were adopted. And one of them would often say, man, your parents were stuck with you. But mine chose me. Now, that's one way to look at it. Isn't that something? I mean, that's the way he looked at it. And that's what God did. God chose that individual through Jesus Christ, and we become accepted with him. Now, that's one level. But how, how about not only being accepted by God, how about less trying to be approved by God, where we actually have a wonderful opportunity to speak up for him? Now, this idea of acceptance reveals that you and I did not evolve from animals. I have yet not seen a chicken psychiatrist, you know, with all my chickens, and they get picked on, pecked on, picked on, picked on, picked on, picked on you know, and all that stuff. And that chicken, you know, is trying to, you know, salvage his life somehow, but it just survives. But we have something inside us that, wants to be accepted. 
Okay, and not only that, we want to be approved. Okay, so second thought, God approves of a son who adamantly adores his words. If you would look in John chapter 4, verse 23. Okay, now if you go to the store, often in uh, the meat section, there'll be a little stamp or something on there where it says USDA approved. Now, it makes me kind of question it, but still, somebody approved of it. Okay? Uh, in the electrical, sometimes they used to put a little tag on the, on the Accord, UL, United Laboratories, or something like that. Okay, it's been checked out and approved. Okay, in... 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, study to show thyself approved. Now, how would you like to have an invisible stamp in your forehead, approved by God? Well, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. You got to work at it. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All the new Bibles take study out. Most of them take divide out because those are the two key in order to be approved by God. In John 14, 23, the Lord kind of had a forerunner verse on this where he said, And Jesus answered, said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John 14, 23. Now, I, I do realize that's still pre-crucifixion, but still, the great promise is associated with the words. Now, if you go back in the Old Testament, you read the story about Abraham and then his nephew Lot. Lot lived in a city of Sodom. Lot was some type of an elected official in Sodom. He was a judge of some type. And when Sodom was going to get blowed off the map, I've driven past the remnants of Sodom. I've driven, I've walked in the place of Gomorrah. I have sulfur, little round sulfur at my house, and that was used to torch that place. And just as the Bible said, it is nothing but ashes today. Now, nobody goes in there. Nobody sees it. It's at the foot of Masada. Everybody goes up to Masada, and nobody sees Gomorrah down at the bottom. Why? Because God torched it. Okay, and he did that by sulfur. Sulfur is uh, like a blue flame for a cutting torch. And when that sulfur came down, fire and brimstone, as the sulfur embedded into the ashes, the oxygen was taken. So then you can dig down a, a couple inches and you find it about anywhere, golf ball size down to any size. You bring that home and put a match to it and that thing will start smoking and it will burn a blue flame. That's Sodom and Gomorrah. Before God did that, he warned Abraham about that. Abraham did the auction thing backwards, you know, 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. And he thought, Lot, Mrs. Lot, four girls, two sons-in-law, that's eight. He's got to have gotten two somewhere in there. And he did not. Of the eight, four of them rejected him, his own family. Okay, and why was Lot? Lot actually, the, in, the angels actually grabbed him and basically drug him out. Why did that happen? It's because Abraham was praying. Lot received a benefit because of Abraham's prayers. And us grandparents, when you pray for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren... They can receive benefits from our prayers. And that's why we need to be, you know, praying for our kids, grandkids, grandkids, great-grandkids. And if you want to go all the way, great-great-grandkids. And if they're not so great, still pray for them. Okay, but that, God accepted Lot. Why? Because of Abraham's prayers. He was a man of faith. You read in Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith chapter, there are 12 verses given to that one man. Abraham. That's why Lot was accepted. Why did Job, how did Job endure what he went through? He didn't have a written Bible. He didn't have the indwelling of the Spirit of God. And when it got to the end of Job, the three guys, uh, the three guys that came and you know, harassed him or tried to comfort him, I guess you could say, God said to those three guys, he said, 
Job spoke right and you spoke wrong. And if you go ask Job, he'll pray for you. I'll accept Job, but not you. That's quite a thing. Why did God accept Job? Job 23, 12 says, Job said this, Neither have I gone back from thy commandments. I have esteemed thy word more than my necessary food. He didn't even have a Bible. He had no written scripture of God, but God spoke to Job through dreams and visions, and he said, I esteem that more than my necessary food. That's why God accepted him. You know, people put this book down, don't pick it up, and then they wonder why they don't have the blessings. It's from that book. It's what you do with that book. In Joshua 1, verse 8, the very first man in the Bible that was ordered by God to base your life upon a written book, he said, This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. And then he says, You're going to have good success. It was a book. That's Joshua. Joshua was the first man. It's the sixth book in the Bible. It's the first book named after a man. You've got Joshua, six letters. Joshua is Hebrew to English. In the New Testament, from Greek to English is Jesus. Joshua, Jesus. It's the equivalent, the exact same word, just a different language. Jesus Christ was called the Word of God seven times in the Bible. He's called the Word of God, uppercase W. That's why we've got to get in that book. And that's where the blessing of God occurs. And that's how we can please God. And that's how we ought to walk and please God. How do we please God? We find out what he likes and what he dislikes. And we go toward what he likes. We go away from what he dislikes. And that's how we please him. And that's how we can be approved by God. Boy, isn't that a blessing to be approved by God? Can you imagine an eternal God being and he he can be approved by him? You and I can actually be a blessing to him. Most people are saying, I want to go to church and get a blessing. I want to go to get a blessing. How about us being a blessing to God? If I were God, I would need a God psychologist. I would be depressed. Why? Seven billion people on this planet, and how many of them even consider him? You talk about discouragement, but our God in heaven is not discouraged. It's all a plan. It's all a plan. The vast majority of religions are faking it, mocking it, or counterfeiting it. And God basically remains silent. Why? Because he's got a plan. And somehow we can be an encouragement, if we can be, or a blessing to God Almighty. By picking up this glorious book and studying it. And learn how to rightly divide it. And when somebody adds to or subtracts from it, we kind of sort of, hey, what'd you do there? And call them on it. And that's how we can be approved by God. We are accepted by God through justification. Wonderful thing. We are approved by God through sanctification. And then we pray for glorification in the presence of God. And that's the program he has for us. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray that you'd help us Some folks have a very tough background, very difficult background, Lord, and they feel rejected. And, Lord, I pray you'd help them feel accepted in the beloved through Jesus Christ. Help us to rest in that great doctrinal truth. And when we can feel accepted by our God, by our Creator, by our Maker, by our Savior, that will give us a confidence That we can stand alone and proclaim your words to be approved by you. And then you will use our words to help others to come to you. I pray you'd help us to recognize the wonderful joy that we have of being accepted by God. And then the wonderful thing, the idea of being approved by God so we could speak up for him. Well, heads bowed and eyes are closed. Your panels will play if you need the altar. Maybe you can accept that fact if you've never trusted the Lord. Well, he is worthy of all acceptation. And when you accept what the Lord has offered, there's a God in heaven that accepts you. Then we can grow in grace, get in his book, And we learn to rightly divide the word of truth. We recognize the differences between things in the Bible. 
And then God in heaven says, wow, that's great. They are serious about my book. Lord, help us each and every one who are born again say that we would study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing word of truth. And that will give us a confidence in your word, not a confidence in our flesh, but a confidence in you and in your word. We thank you for that wonderful opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. We're-